All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to session one, track three of our Big Sioux River Water Summit. Uh, my name is Holly Meyer and I'm the sustainability coordinator for the city of Sioux Falls. Um, and I have the privilege of introducing our first speaker today. Uh, before I do that, I just wanna mention, again, this session is from 1.30 to two, um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. If you have any questions, please, type those in the chat and then I will um, let Jeremiah know what those are after his presentation. So I will go ahead and introduce him. All right, so Jeremiah Bergstrom is our first speaker. He has been a licensed landscape architect for over 20 years. He's an expert in water resource management, including green infrastructure planning, stormwater best management practice design, watershed planning, native plant materials, and ecological restoration. Currently, Jeremiah is an instructor of landscape architecture at South Dakota State University. He teaches a broad spectrum of courses covering design and planning from concept to detail. Prior to joining SDSU, Jeremiah served for nine years as senior research project manager at Rutgers Cooperative Extension Water Resources Program in New Brunswick, New Jersey. His work has included investigations at both the site scale as well as larger regional scale collaborations. Specifically, he has spent significant effort on planning, design, and implementation of distributed and disconnected stormwater management strategies in urban and suburban landscapes to meet governmental standards. Jeremiah frequently facilitates planning and design efforts with multidisciplinary collaborations. He has also developed and conducted training programs on green infrastructure strategies, stormwater management planning and permitting, rain garden design, as well as environmentally sensitive and sustainable site planning. So we're in for a treat to hear him talk today. Thank you for being here, everybody. Um, Jeremiah, I am going to make you the host or make you the presenter. All right. You should be able to unmute. Oh, I can unmute now. That sounds okay, good. Okay, and you should be able to share your screen. All right, let's get that to see how that's going to work here. It's going to work perfect. All right. Can everybody see this? Yes. yes. Are we good to go, Holly? We're good to go. Let's take it away. All right. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you uh, um, to Holly and everyone in Sioux Falls for inviting me to participate in the, in the presentations uh, on the conference today. So. Um, I, I just want to give a quick overview. Um, again, I just recently uh, located back to the Midwest, uh, originally grew up in Iowa, uh, and then spent about 20, 25 years out on the East Coast um, uh, as a landscape architect and working really specializing in water resources management. And so I came back excited to be teaching at SDSU and uh, said, okay, and water resources, you know, everything's going to be different here in South Dakota than it was out on the East Coast. Um, so what, what, where do we start and how do, we, how do I integrate uh, some of the water resources expertise I have into some of the studios and the classes that I'm teaching and, and what other work can I do and bring my expertise to bear on, on some of the, you know, the issues as well as some of the opportunities here in South Dakota for, for managing water uh, in our landscape. And so I wanna start the uh, presentation off with this map because this one really is the map that kind of intrigued me and kind of got me going and really started ask, I started asking lots of questions yeah, okay, you know, when you start thinking about stormwater, you're thinking about water resources, you gotta know how much water you have to deal with. And so I started looking around, I said, okay, how much rainfall do we get uh, in, uh, in South Dakota? And this map came. I said, this is a beautiful map. Use this map in a presentation that I, uh, that I gave at the state fair. And then, then I really started looking at the map and I said, now, wait a minute, this map, while it's, it's beautiful and it has some interesting, you know, you know, numbers on it and it tells us kind of what the average annual rainfall is, you notice here the data on this map is a bit dated and i'm like wait a minute this this map only represents the time period from 1960 to 1990. it's almost it's 2020 now that's 30 years of data we're missing 30 years of precipitation that we don't really know what's happening here and may have some bearing on how we uh, manage uh, water in the landscape and, and and maybe has some bearing on the impacts that communities are seeing. So I said, okay, I got to start looking at this a little bit deeper. I got to come with some, find out what's going on because there's a big gap here between 1990 and 2020. And so I started looking around and then trying to like, okay, what's going on? What's going on with the, the climate? Uh, what's going on with rainfall in particular? How much rain are we getting? Um, and when is it coming? 
Uh, and, and is it getting worse? You know, uh, on the East Coast, we're talking about some big storms coming in, really creating so, some uh, some difficulties in managing um, uh, flooding. Um, so what's happening here in South Dakota? And where, where so where can I start? So I found this report, uh, a climate science special report just issued in 2017. Uh, so a lot of the figures you see in the next few slides are from here. I've put sources on here, so you can go back and check. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, um, and not going to go into a lot of detail, but hopefully kind of show you some of the trends of the things that they're predicting are going to happen moving forward. So these are some predictions that we're seeing, and then put out by climate researchers. Uh, this report was, report was done under the auspices of NOAA, National Oceanic um, and uh, Atmospheric Association. So uh, it's it's done with scientifically valid data. Uh, so we're looking at this and says, what are they finding? So they're finding that, hey, guess what? We're getting more rain. Uh, the data shows for the second half of the century. This looks at um, percent increase or percent change in rainfall from 1986 to 2015. And if you look at South Dakota, you're seeing uh, on average uh, that we're getting anywhere from 5 to 15 percent uh, more rain every year. And if you go back to that map, oh, I'm going to just back up to this map. I want to go back here one second. If you look on the eastern side of South Dakota, the Big Sioux River watershed, you're seeing in that green area, we're getting anywhere on average of 20 to 26 inches of rain uh, every year uh, based on this data uh, through 1990. So it's 20 to 26 inches of rain every year in the Big Sioux watershed. So what does that mean for here in South Dakota? We're talking about another 10 to 15 percent. So that's another two, two, two to three inches of rain every year we're getting uh, uh, or going to be expecting to get uh, in, moving forward in this in this um, in our in our region. Uh, and I think it more importantly is also when is this rain coming? Our rain is coming based on this data and based on this in this analysis this is coming in the spring and the fall kind of those bridge seasons not it. And so what does that mean? What is that telling us if we're getting a lot more rain rainfall um, precipitation in the fall in particular here, it's very dark. So we're seeing more than 15% increase in fall uh, for that. So what does this tell us? It's telling us we're getting more rain and it's coming at, in the spring and the fall. We'll get back to this a little bit more. Um, some additional figures they're sharing here. Uh, observed changes um, in daily precipitation. Again, you can see the greatest changes here. These are in inches. Um, you can see here the biggest changes are in the spring and the fall with a tenth to about a quarter of an inch difference in those time periods as opposed to just a hundred uh, or four hundredths in, in the winter and the summer on precipitation there. So we are getting more rainfall and it's coming in those time periods. Um, and now, not only are we getting more rain, it's coming in the spring and the fall, but what about storms? Are we getting more storms? Are we getting more intense storm events? This graphic, if you look at it, uh, it's looking at five year recurrence interval storm events, uh, where in two days we're getting anywhere from three to four inches of rain. In eastern South Dakota, a five year recurrence interval for storm fall or rainfall precipitation is about three or four inches of rain. So, in looking at this graph, you can see relative number of extreme events um, by a percentage here. And again, looking at this 1990 data, this is where our last chart, that beautiful red and green map, the yellow green map, ended. It was in 1990. We're seeing a lot more of these five year storm events happening over a period of two days. We're getting three to four inches of rain. Uh, and so we're getting uh, several um, uh, uh, more storm events every year that are um, dropping larger amounts of rain. Again, looking at this heavy precipitation. So, again, I'm going through these very quickly, just kind of showing some trends of what they found. And again, I was a little disturbed by some of this because I don't, this isn't drilling down specifically into the exact numbers in South Dakota, but we're going to get there in a second. So again, heavy precipitation. Again, um, this represents um, percent exceedances. Uh, again, five-year maximums, um, five-year rainfall totals, uh, exceedances uh, over two days and or exceedances over the 99 percentile storms. And you can see that for the most part in some of our areas, we're getting anywhere from 20 to 30 percent increase. Again, these are percent exceedances. Uh, an exceedance of 20 to 30 percent in our region uh, of these heavier uh, frequency, heavier pre precipitation events and the frequency of those heavy precipitation events. Again, not as heavy as some areas of the country. Eastern part of this, the country is getting, is seeing a lot more of those heavy events. But again, 20 to 30 percent is a significant increase. Um, uh, and is it going to have some kind of impact on how we think about water resources management, in particular stormwater runoff uh, and managing that in our in our urban and suburban landscapes. 
So what did this, this, this uh, climate report find? Well, they found that, yes, we are getting more rain, especially in no the northern and southern plains region of the United States. Um, heavier precipitation events are increasing in intensity and frequency uh, in the latter half of the, of the last century and into this century. Uh, this report uh, worked through data through 2015, actually. Uh, and the frequency and intensity of these heavy participation, precipitation events uh, are projected to continue to increase uh, into the 21st century. And again, in the northern United States, where we are at is predicted to see, receive more precipitation in winter and spring. And extreme snowfalls uh, will be increasing. Um, western parts of the state are actually seeing less, and they're seeing a loss um, in snowpack, while these extreme snowfall events uh, are projected to be increasing in our region uh, of the country. So, okay, some of these are kind of general, but do we have anything more specific? Something that can really tell us what's going on here in South Dakota, be a little bit closer to home. And so I really wanna answer some more of these questions about how, do the, how does these changes impact our communities here in South Dakota? And, and, and what do our communities need to know as they start thinking about water and stormwater and, and management uh, strategies moving forward? And so I reached out to my colleague, uh, Dr. McMain, Dr. John McMain, he's gonna speak uh, following me today. And I said, hey, John, what do we know about water and precipitation and how it impacts our, our urban and suburban communities? He said, well, I think there's a paper you should read. And I'm like, okay, why should I read this paper? This one is all about evapotranspiration and corn. I'm talking about stormwater in our urban and uh, suburban landscapes. He said, just read it. I'm like, all right, you have a PhD. I'm gonna listen to you. Let, I'll read through it and see what, see what comes of this. And so, believe it or not, Chris Hay and Dennis Toady were looking at the same questions that I was asking. They were looking at it for different reasons, agricultural reasons, as it relates to evapotranspiration and drainage in soils uh, and the need for additional artificial drainage potentially in South Dakota. And if you look at this map here and look at the data behind it, they're looking at the period of rainfall and precipitation from 1991 to 2009. This report was published in 2011. They were of the same concern that I had that, hey, that last map only looked at 1961 to 1990. We need to know what is happening since that time in rainfall. And what they found on average in this map here is that we're seeing in our region anywhere from two to over five inches of additional rainfall every year in our region. Uh, and that is significant. That's 10 to 20% increase in rainfall. That's gonna have an impact on our built environment as well as it was, uh, as it has on the, um, crop and agricultural landscapes that they were uh, evaluating. So how do we take this data and how do we apply this? And what does it mean for us as we begin thinking about changing the way we manage stormwater? And in addition to this, a few other things came out looking a little more uh, closely at South Dakota, uh, NOAA and some of their results that went beyond uh, that previous report has shown that since 1990, South Dakota has averaged 14% more one inch rain events. We're seeing a greater frequency of these one inch, very intense storm events that are dropping a lot of rain very quickly on our landscape. In addition, we are going to continue to see a projected increase in winter precipitation of anywhere to 10 to 20 percent. And again, building on the results that we saw in that previous study uh, for the country, uh, um, the, the, the Hay and Toady report did also find that our fall and winter precip precipitation is going to increase or has in, or did increase uh, over that same time period. Again, these weren't project, these aren't projections forward. These are actual maps showing the data from that time period of 1991 to 2009. And these are percent increases in uh, precipitation in the fall and winter months. And again, we're seeing anywhere from 20 to 30% in most of our region uh, uh, of, of Eastern South Dakota uh, in, uh, in both fall and winter. So that is a significant change in when and how much rain we're getting on an average annual basis. And again, wrapping up with this NOAA map showing these predictions of additionally, we're seeing 15%, uh, we're projected to see an increase of approximately 15% uh, more winter precipitation, more snowfall on average. And so what is this, what is this telling us? And so moving forward, we're gonna get to this. I wanna just wrap up with one last map, getting back to that original data uh an analysis you know we do have some additional information again this shows that most of the region of uh, uh of the big sioux river uh is receiving anywhere from 20 to 26 inches of rain 
And if you go and you look at data that's now available through Mesonet and the climate uh, here uh, at ASD State University, and you look at those weather stations that they have um, uh, in, in this region and in this watershed, and look at the rainfall totals in inches for the last two full years. I did not put 2020 in here, but I did uh, the last full two, two years. You can see that we have, I think most significant here, we have four instances where we have over 30 inches of rain in 2018 at four um, weather station sites. And in 2019, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine instances of receiving over 30 inches of rain. And that is a significant increase over our average projections. And again, these average projections and how we think about managing stormwater are what we use to design and plan for and have historically used to design and plan for managing water in our communities. So these changes are significant, right? 10 to 20% more in building on the, the, the data that was previously uh, um, uh, pulled together um, by hey, Chris Hay and, and Tody and their report. And again, also uh, kind of um, building on the, those projections that we're seeing there and trying to go back and find some data for the entire time period of 2010 to 2019. Again, this map and this data was from 1961 to 1990. Uh, the other report Chris Hay and Tody put together was from 1991 to 2009. But if we look at 2010 to 2019, and I was able to find rainfall data for all of those 10 years uh, from the Sioux Falls weather station through um, the National Weather Service, and you average that out, on average, Sioux Falls over that time period received over 30 inches of rain um, each year. Uh, historically, that average is 26.38. That's right written here, where we're at right there. So again, we're seeing a significant increase in rainfall, and that's coming in these bridge seasons and also the winter months. So what does this mean for the South Dakota communities? Thinking about the landscape, thinking about what, um, how water moves uh, and, and through the landscape uh, is, is where we need to start revisiting uh, our strategies for managing stormwater. So we think about our landscape here in South Dakota. We're a fairly young landscape. Uh, geologically speaking, we're fairly flat uh, and it's a very immature young landscape, uh, especially our built communities uh, in and around our built communities. We've, we've, I, uh, we've built those communities in flatter areas where we have easier uh, time uh, uh, developing the land. Uh, and those areas really cannot quickly drain runoff from these increasingly intense storms. Uh, and these intense storms are creating these frequent nuisance flooding events uh, and property damage. Um, again, this addi additional rainfall and these changes uh, are really, um, you know, pu putting a lot of pressure on the landscape. Many of our soils have limited capacity for infiltrating stormwater quickly, especially once they're disturbed. Um, we have high clay content in many of these areas. We also have seasonal high water table in some areas. Uh, we also have highly erodible soils. And so once we disturb those soils and alter those soils and build on those soils, we, we are really limiting the capacity of those soils um, to infiltrate stormwater uh, as it would uh, naturally uh, in an undisturbed landscape. Um, one of the things I think is really also uh, important for us to consider is that all this excess precipitation in the fall, winter, and the spring is really going to contribute to bank full stream conditions. When we have bank full stream conditions, we cannot get water out of our communities, out of our pipes, out of our stormwater infrastructure and flood control infrastructure and downstream. Uh, those high bank flows are basically plugging up and clogging our drain. And so that water is really um, going to back up in our communities and not be allowed to flow downstream because of those bank flow conditions caused by fall, winter, and spring uh, precipitation that is not being taken up um, because soils are frozen, it's not being used by plants because plants are not actively growing in those months, in many of those months. All right, and then finally, I think the, these conditions all combine to really show that there is somewhat of a limited capacity for moving water very quickly for these larger centralized drainage infrastructure, those end of pipe solutions that um, during uh, wet periods uh, are going to be inundated uh, and really don't have anywhere that they can exit uh, and discharge their flows. If we put all of that water in those systems all at once, very quickly, we are going to overwhelm them uh, and you know, create back, um, backwater impacts in, into uh, our built landscapes and neighborhoods. So how do, where do we go from here? Thinking about the 21st century, 
really, we need to think about the land. Managing water and managing storm in particular moving forward is all about the land. Uh, we need to capture that water. We need to keep it on the land. We're talking about, again, about that water that runs off when it rains. Every time we go in and we alter that landscape, we increase the flow of water running off that landscape, and we have to start managing that. Um, unless we can somehow keep it on that landscape, slow it down. If we push it all downstream as quickly as possible, we get pipes like this where we have them completely inundated. Water cannot flow out of this pipe if it's already half full or more. We probably saw this several times uh, over the past few years, and the past few winters in particular, when we had bank flow conditions in the Big Sioux River, especially um, down in the, the lower reaches um, of the watershed. We only can get so much water into our storm system. Our inlets are, have a limited capacity. And when we exceed that capacity, we get conditions like this, this nuisance flooding, water backing up, creating water quality as well as safety issues uh, and drainage issues in our built environment. So how can we keep that water on the land and use the land to benefit us? Well, we need to think a little bit differently. We need a slow runoff down. We have so um, so often and, and, and really effectively worked on moving that water more quickly downstream, pushing it into the pipes, pushing it into our infrastructure network, and getting it downstream so it becomes someone else's problem. We need to reverse that thinking and slow that runoff down. Keep it on the land. Disconnect that flow from going directly into the pipes. Instead of concentrating it, spreading that water out. Don't allow it to be, or don't put it all into one simple system, but actually Put it into a series of systems close to where it is hitting the ground uh, and allowing a variety of management strategies to help us um, reduce the pressure on our existing infrastructure network. And again, think about the landscape as a stormwater management tool. Plants and soils are our friends. They are some of the best management strategies we have in thinking about delaying peak flows and slowing water down. So where do we begin? Uh, I'm going to talk about a, a study that we recently completed um, uh, in uh, the city uh, of Brookings here. Uh, and so we looked at it in this way and thinking through it. And I'll show you kind of the steps we went through and thinking about the land and the landscape as a stormwater management strategy um, uh, for uh, reducing the pressure uh, and, uh, on existing infrastructure and hopefully eliminating and alleviating flo flooding uh, in, in the community. So we focus on soils. Understanding where that water comes from and then where it's flowing. Not, it's not rocket science, but also then analyzing and prioritizing, but really beginning that, 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 in, that analysis, understanding the landscape, working with the soil. So we got to get out there. We got to look at the soils. We got to map those soils. We got to understand where those areas are that flood frequently and know that we can't really expect those areas that flood frequently, as shown on the map on the left here, uh, to provide a lot of stormwater management. They're providing flood protection flood mitigation. We got to actually keep that water or slow that water down from getting to those places so quickly. Where can we do that? Well, let's look at the soils. We got to find areas where the soils um, will allow water to infiltrate at least to, you know, one or two feet. Where do we have water table depths that will allow that? Where do we have soils that will quickly allow water to infiltrate? Looking at hydrologic soil groups and permeability. Where are those areas that we have, you know, higher quality soils that will allow this to happen. Uh, we did not see in Brookings a lot of A and B soils, um, which are the best soils for infiltrating uh, um, uh, water, but we did find several B soils uh, and those moderate uh, soils. And so we need to look at those soils as opportunities, but also understand that there are some constraints and we may not be able to get a, a lot of water in there over an extended period of time. So how do we design and develop strategies that will take advantage of that, but not overwhelm uh, those soils? And again, really going out there and looking at them, testing them, finding out okay, where do we have less than an inch an hour of infiltration? Where do we have kind of that, that middle ground where we can get water into the ground in a, in, you know, um, at a rate of one to two inches? And then maybe are there any areas where we can get water uh, to infiltrate at a, at, a, at a rate greater than three inches? Um, very few of those uh, I would anticipate in many of our areas uh, in Eastern South Dakota, our soils just don't support that. Uh, our characteristics do not allow for that. And that's the other thing. We need to really know what those soils are. And look at those soils, not just at the, at the surface, but also looking at, look at them in profile. And so we have these soils here where we can see deeper soils. We're not going to be able to get into there. After we get 18 to 24 inches into the ground, 
we are already hitting some heavy dense clay areas. And so we need to think about infiltration just at the surface. All right. And characterizing them and mapping them, understanding where the water is coming from, mapping those impervious areas. This is where all the water is coming from, from rooftops and from um, um, uh, roadways uh, and parking lots. We did this. We mapped all of the rights of ways and all of the rooftops and looked at them in dr the different drainage areas and then mapping out what the flow and how that moves through uh, and where the water is going. And then pulling all of that together so that we can then see where can we potentially go in and identify areas where we see a lot of water running off the landscape, where we have over 40% of the land covered with impervious areas of rooftops and roads and things like that and maybe go into those areas and focus on land-based strategies in adjacent areas, to slow that water down. And again, this landscape is so flat. We can't move water quickly because we have less than 1% slopes in many of our communities in many of these areas. That limits the capacity and the ability of these areas to, to function for long-term stormwater management. Um, and so, uh, and move things quickly. Here, again, prioritizing, where do we have the majority uh, of, of stormwater being contributed by impervious cover? And where do we have soils that could support potentially, potentially support landscape-based strategies or land-based strategies, slow that water down before it gets into the pipe? So, just to wrap things up, changing precipitation patterns are gonna require us to not just think about the, only those big storms. That large storm event is not the only thing we have to concern ourselves about. Those small, more frequent storm events are creating a lot of pressure on our existing systems. And they're also creating chronic seasonal high flows and waterways, which limit the ability for these downstream end of pipe solutions to really provide flood control uh, over the course of a given year. And again, if we can capture and slow the runoff and stormwater at its source before it can get into the pipe, we can really begin to take that pressure off of those infrastructure systems that we currently have. And again, those landscape-based strategies distributed and disconnected throughout the landscape provide that first line of defense to reduce runoff volumes, minimize our peak flows, filter runoff, address some pollution and water quality issues, as well as take pressure off that existing infrastructure. So with that, I will leave it at this. I'll open it up to any questions. I know I'm just about out of time, I believe. Um, hopefully I didn't take too long with that. So again, we need to think about managing water and stormwater, thinking about starting the land and the landscape as, a, as uh, a critical first step in the process. And remember, we're all in the same bathtub and we only can send so much water down that drain at one time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. That was interesting. Um, very good feed for the food for thought. Um, we have maybe time for one question. If anyone has a question, go ahead and type that in the chat. Right. I stopped sharing. Yep, and I am going to. There we go. Okay. Any questions? Until somebody has a question, um, I do have one. Yeah. Jeremiah, did you and your team do that mapping of Brookings or? Yes. Okay. We did we did we 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 did the mapping of the impervious cover and the soils mapping. We we obtained the um the 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 pipe networks and the inlets and outlets, the drainage network from the city itself. Okay. So we did not map we did not not map the stormwater drainage system. It was already mapped by the city. Uh, but we did map um all of the um impervious cover and then the uh, and did the soils mapping. That's really helpful. Do you see any other communities in, you know, eastern South Dakota doing that type of work? Um, I haven't seen any yet. Um, we've had a few inquiries about others that are interested in the process we went through. Um, and uh, we'd like to, you know, collaborate more uh, and, and are interested in doing that um, moving forward. Great. Yeah, I, I'm interested. <laughs> Um, well, I don't see any questions in the chat, um, but thank you so much. That was a lot of good data and good to see the, you know, the, the climatic changes over time and what's coming and good for us to think about for planning. Thank you. All right. Welcome everyone to 
Let's see, track three, session two. Um, my name is Holly Meyer and I'm the sustainability coordinator with the city of Sioux Falls. And I get the uh, opportunity to introduce our second speaker today, John McMain. Um, just another note, if you're joining us now, um, any, any questions you have for the presenter, go ahead and type those into the chat on the side. And if we have some time at the end, I'll go ahead and read those to our presenter. Um, and then I will also be placing the links for the next track or for the next talks and the different tracks into the chat at the end of the talk. So on to the introductions. So our speaker is John McMain today, Dr. John McMain. Um, he is an assistant professor and water management engineer, extension state specialist in the agricultural and biosystems engineering department at South Dakota State University. Believing that everyone plays a role in water quality, Dr. McMain's research and outreach program broadly focuses on urban and agricultural water management and water quality. A native of Kentucky, Dr. McMain earned a BS and MS degree in biosystems and agricultural engineering from the University of Kentucky and a PhD in biosystems engineering from Oklahoma State University. In his current role, he works with various stakeholder groups on research and outreach at the intersection of water and soil health, livestock environmental issues, tile drainage, and green stormwater infrastructure. We are very lucky to have his expertise here for the presentation. Welcome, John, and I am going to make you the presenter. All right, you should have the ability to, there you go. All right, can you hear and see? Yes and yes. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, man, it's, it's good to be back at the uh, Big Sioux River Water Summit, virtual as it may be. Um, this was one of the first events I came to whenever I first moved to South Dakota in 2017. Uh, the picture on my first slide here, this is, uh, this is the second time in my life I was in South Dakota is when this picture was taken and it was actually on my interview. Uh, so Van Kelly, Dr. Van Kelly, department head picked me up at the airport, took me to Falls Park and it was about 12 degrees out and I think we ended up getting six or eight inches of snow over the time I was here in South Dakota, but decided to come anyways, um, and it's been great. So I really appreciate being in South Dakota, really love the energy and the the interest in water that I've seen across various stakeholder groups. And so i um, very glad to be able to present to this audience and present about stormwater. So Jeremiah and I uh, worked together a fair amount. And he did a really great job of kind of setting the stage related to climate and why we are uh, thinking about water and why we need to think about water differently. And so I'm going to try to build on that presentation, talk about some strategies related to green stormwater infrastructure, but also some of the barriers that we face and how we can overcome those. So as Jeremiah said, um, the problem, it's a water quantity problem in large part. And basically we've disconnected the surface and the ground uh, or the, the above the surface and below the surface. And we've done that through impervious surfaces. And so by doing that, it increases the peak flow and the total runoff volume. And it also brings about some other interesting issues. Um, let's see if I can bring up my laser pointer here. So we also go from a infiltration dominated system where most of the water is going into the ground. And this, this really feeds base flow. Um, and so you have, you have a system where you have a, a high connectivity between the surface and the groundwater and the shallow groundwater. And then when you go to kind of the urban water cycle, you've disconnected the surface and the groundwater and you've uh, connected a lot of impervious surfaces. So now you have a system that is runoff dominated rather than being infiltration dominated. And because of that, you, your streams dry up, you don't have any more base flow and you have a, a much flashier event. So you have high increase of, of runoff and a steep decrease of runoff. Your hydrograph becomes very uh, tight. And so that, that brings about some issues uh, from water quantity perspective. But we also, of course, think about it from a water quality perspective. 
And if, if you've lived in the Midwest or even in Kentucky, where I'm from originally, uh, the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia is something that's not too far from the conversation when we talk about water quality. And this is a nitrate and phosphorus issue, um, so nutrients. And basically, we have too many nutrients in the Gulf of Mexico. They cause uh, pretty big algal problems. And when, those, when that algae uh, dies, then as it decomposes, it uses up a lot of oxygen. And so because of that, we have what's called the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, um, somewhere around the size of New Jersey, uh, where Jeremiah worked for many years. And I work with both urban and agriculture groups, and, and I see a lot of finger pointing. And um, I, I like to show this because it really demonstrates to me that while there's a lot of land coverage uh, that agriculture contributes, uh, there's a still significant portion that urban areas contribute uh, to nutrient loading and sediment and just water quantity in general downstream. So urban runoff um, and urban systems in the built environment are something that we need to think about from a water quantity and a water quality perspective. But it's not so straightforward. Um, and so these are some questions that came out of a review paper that uh, some of us did in 2015. And some the Great Plains, this is when I was in Oklahoma, they, they present some interesting, uh, maybe somewhat unique issues. And one of them is climate. And um, as Jeremiah talked about and as Laura Edwards talks about, our state climatologist, we're getting uh, more intense storms as well as more intense drought. Uh, we're in something, or, or there's a concept that we hear about related to drought called flash drought. So uh, it's where a, a basically your your moisture is low enough that when you get any stretch of, of low rainfall, then you go into a flash drought. It's a sudden onset drought. So climate is one issue or one challenge, I should say. The other challenge is more from a visibility perspective. So uh, there's very few population centers in the Great Plains really. Um, you can you can go long stretches where there's maybe small towns, um, maybe no towns at all, and so that limits local awareness and perception that stormwater and managing stormwater is really an issue. And then, so as we seek to address these and and research these problems, it's a challenge to kind of understand and validate performance across these different scales, as well as function, as well as time periods. And so a lot of the work we do, we do kind of at the, the parcel scale, or if you have one home, or if you have, you know, one lot, but how does that scale up to a neighborhood? And then if you go even to the, you know, to city scale, to city of Sioux Falls, or even to a full watershed, so uh, the Big Sioux River, for example, how do those scale? And then we think about function. So we talked about water quantity and water quality already, but then there's other things that uh, we lose function when we change the hydrology. Some of these could be things like pollinators, um, habitat, different functions that the landscape provides that we lose whenever we urbanize. And then the other question is related to time. So we can measure something, how it performs, when we initially construct it, but how does that compare long-term? Um, does it still function over time? What maintenance does it need? Things like that. So these are all kind of questions that we face um, in the Great Plains and some of the challenges that we have, and which really introduces the need for demonstration and research to uh, increase the uptake of these practices and kind of uh, guide the future for these practices in stormwater. And so that brings up something called green infrastructure or green stormwater infrastructure or low impact development. You'll see these three terms kind of used interchangeably. There are some differences, but uh, we won't get into those today. Um, the initial focus on this was water quantity. Uh, so initially we wanted to reduce the runoff volume from impervious areas and reduce the peak flow as well as water quality. Uh, we wanted to give water the ability to be infiltrated, to be filtrated, to remove pollutants before it went on its merry way down to a lake or a stream or the Big Sioux River. And the way it does that, the way it addresses these two things is to imitate pre-development hydrology. So again, we're going from a runoff dominated system, which is what an urban a built environment is, and we're trying to get it back to an infiltration dominated system, which is kind of the natural condition. 
Uh, we reduce peak flow and total runoff volume, and we improve water quality using the functionality of the landscape. And one example, probably the most familiar example, uh, or one of the most familiar examples, is a rain garden. Now, this is uh, one example of a rain garden. You have, well, no, just kidding. Um, so who benefits from well-managed stormwater? Um, really, if you think about some of the issues that Jeremiah brought up, you have homeowners that are downstream that may have wet basements, they may have flooding, and these are stakeholders that benefit from uh, well-managed stormwater. You also have municipalities and stormwater utilities who have to uh, build out systems to manage the stormwater. So think uh, storm sewers and uh, culverts and drains and curb and gutter systems and detention basins, all of these things that have to have to be used to manage stormwater. And then de developers. So developers have to account for the extra water that that their development is going to produce. And so in doing that, uh, they want to look for ways to reduce the volume and the peak flow of runoff. And so we think about all those stakeholder groups and all of them could benefit from less water going downstream to more management being done at the source of, of where runoff is generated. And so really the question is everyone can benefit from well-managed stormwater, uh, just slightly different ways, but everyone can uh, benefit if we manage water on the landscape close to the source of where it's produced. Okay, so who's responsible for well-managed stormwater? Well, really, uh, it could be any of these individuals, um, and this is a, maybe a more philosophical question, but uh, when we think about responsibility for managing stormwater, uh, I think like water quality, all of us can have an impact on stormwater, and so all of us have a responsibility. So really, I'm going to leave this as, a, as an unanswered question, but look at some of the barriers that each of these groups face. So what are some of the current barriers? Well, if you're a homeowner, I'd say knowledge, experience, and belief are the three core barriers. So knowledge is about the problem. So, you know, a homeowner may not even know necessarily that runoff from the roof is you know, it, it, it doesn't function the same way that before there was a home there, the water's not going into the ground and said it's going to the storm sewer. And then if they know about the problem, they may not know how to solve it. Um, but then even if they know, you know, what the practice is to solve it, say a rain garden or a rain barrel, well, then there's a, a learning curve to design and building a rain garden or putting in a rain barrel. And then there's a belief hurdle. And I think there's a belief hurdle in almost every beneficial management practice that we think about. So does it really work? Can it really work for me? I hear this from farmers. I hear it from homeowners. Uh, I hear it from, you know, a lot of the practitioners that could be making a difference doing this work. And then there's the developer stakeholder group. And really some of their barriers would be similar to the, the ones that the homeowners have, knowledge, experience, and belief. But then there's also some institutional barriers. So municipal code may not allow for uh, developers to to innovate, to put in uh, practices that you know they may want to try to manage stormwater. But then it has to be you know be profitable because this is what they do for a living, and so there has to be a return on investment. But then a municipality, well, probably some of the same as the homeowner. Um, but to, for a municipality to build this into code, they have to be able to trust that it works. Um, so if they're going to put in a buyer retention cell or recommend that a buyer retention cell be put in or permeable pavement, they have to trust that this practice is one that's not going to, you know, flood out their, the people that live in their city downstream. So breaking down barriers in South Dakota. First, let's talk about homeowners. So homeowners, I think some of the ways that we can break down the barriers for homeowners is share the burden. Um, don't do anything for free, but maybe take away some of the risk that putting in a rain barrel or a rain garden could, um, could have. So offsetting the risk or the cost that a rain barrel or rain garden would have. So we did a, a project in Brookings. We, uh, it was partially funded by a mini grant 
from the 319 program as well as from East Dakota Water Development District where we did a rain barrel distribution. So uh, 100 rain barrels got distributed in the Brookings area and the, the homeowner had to pay a small amount, about $25. And the mini grant paid for 40 or 50% of the remainder. And because of that, we were able to, to get these rain barrels out in a way that you know didn't overly burden the homeowner. So sharing the burden, I think, is a good first step. But then identifying how the, the benefit can be shared. Um, so you know, if enough rain barrels got put out in the city of Brookings or in the city of Sioux Falls, that could potentially have a real impact on the storm sewer demand. Um, and so perhaps there's an opportunity that we can distribute green stormwater infrastructure solutions to reduce the need for expanded uh, gray infrastructure or storm sewers. We could also potentially reduce potable water demand. Um, and then these can be attractive landscaping features for both the city and for homeowners to kind of raise uh, property values, raise um, standard of living or the quality of living in an area, and then can be habitat and pollinators. Now, one of the biggest uh, gripes I hear about green stormwater infrastructure is that, you know, all this costs money. And what I, um, which is true, like I get that, but I also look at landscaping and think that, man, that, that requires a lot of time and a lot of energy. So this is a, a front yard close to where my in-laws live in Illinois. I walk by this front yard every time I'm at their house. And man, what a gorgeous front yard. I mean, the number, the sheer diversity of species in there, the colors, the, I mean, it's just a beautiful landscape. But if so, Clearly, someone put a lot of time and energy and money into this landscape, but they could change this a little bit, make a few tweaks. So it's collecting stormwater off of the driveway or off of the roof, and it could go from just a landscape that has form to one that has function as well. So this is a rain garden, uh, maybe even less time and money investment into this rain garden that really this has the same form, the same beauty that you would want in a landscape, but it also has a function. Here's another example. So a very kind of straightforward, uh, clean cut looking uh, landscaping that also has stormwater function. So this is a, I think this is a barrier. People think about the cost, but they don't think about the benefit and really they compare it against nothing, whereas they should be comparing against other landscaping um, alternatives. We've also done some workshops uh, in 2018. We did a series of workshops about rain gardens, and this was to get at the barrier of learning about the practice, but also learning how to design the practice. Um, and so I think that's an important piece of breaking down the barrier for uh, homeowners as well as, uh, as others, but to, to learn by doing and actually do a, a design workshop and then the other piece is is putting it into practice. So this is a uh, this is kind of extension of those workshops that we got volunteers together, and we actually constructed this rain garden in the backyard of a home in Sioux Falls. And uh, I like to say that working with volunteers, it's the opposite of Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams is if you build it, they will come. Well, with volunteers, if they come, then we'll build it. But if they don't come, then we're out of luck. So anyway, but I think this is an important way that we can break down that barrier of actually seeing a practice, uh, seeing something go into practice. And then, so that's kind of the homeowner group and really all of those barriers exist for, for the other stakeholder groups. Um, and also the, the same opportunities to learn by design and, and learn by implementation. Um, but then the, the business and industry piece, really we want to um, build some infrastructure that incentivizes innovation. And so this is a program in Lexington, Kentucky, where I did my master's. Um, and in Lexington, there's a stormwater utility that if you have impervious area, um, you're required to pay a certain fee uh, based on the amount of impervious area you have. And if you treat that impervious area with a rain garden or a green roof or permeable pavement, 
then you can reduce the amount that you pay uh, for your stormwater fee. And then the proceeds or the income that they have from that stormwater fee goes towards building infrastructure. So building rain gardens, they do cost share for uh, any stormwater management practices. And all of this is really done to encourage innovation, um, help incentivize business and industry, uh, the, the private sector in, in innovating. So either through uh, what, they, what they pay, uh, through a stick or through a carrot with what they can, can get. And I believe muni municipalities can lead. They can lead through things like demonstration projects, um, educational signage, monitoring, updating standards, um, and then incentivizing implementation. These are all ways that municipalities can lead in innovation. Uh, so we did a little modeling to look at, you know, what good can we actually do with green infrastructure? I'm going to run through this very quickly. Uh, so this was a neighborhood in Brookings, South Dakota, recently completed by my uh, master's student working with me, Farhana Actor, And she looked at kind of three scenarios for um, private practices and then three scenarios for public practices. And then we had a, a high, medium, and low level of imp implementation for both the private and the public practices. And then uh, she looked at how much does this impact peak flows and how much does this impact flow volume. And so this is the flow volume reduction and this is the percent reduction from the baseline. So she started with whatever it was in its existing state and again looked at the three scenarios with scenario one, two, and three being high, medium, and low uh, implementation for the private and then four, five, and six being the high, medium, and low for the public. And what we see, is especially in these high implementation scenarios, um, and this is the how big a storm is. So 100-year storm, pretty big. Two-year storm, not that big. It's about uh, two and a half inches. And so um, under the high implementation scenario, we got significant reduction of uh, volume. And so we're basically demonstrating that if we were able to implement that level of green stormwater infrastructure, we could reduce uh, between 20 and 25% of the total volume for, for this two year storm uh, that would not go into the storm sewer. So that's significant. I mean, that, that could basically extend the uh, amount of, the number of years that you have to before you have to expand your storm sewer system by implementing green stormwater infrastructure. So that's very exciting. And then the, and of course, um, you know, if you had varying levels of implementation, you know, for example, the, the mid, mid levels, um, that's closer to, to between five and 10%. At very low levels, you're under 5% reduction. Um, but what we can look at is, what if we combine these two? So we didn't do a scenario where we combine private and public practices, but if we combine these two, then a lot of that would stack. So we would get not just 15% from the private, 23% from the public, but we'd get you know, closer to 40% reduction. Um, but that is a significant investment that would have to be made. For peak flow, uh, we see kind of similar results, but one difference is the uh, peak flow reduction for the highest implementation level for the public infrastructure. So permeable pavement and bioretention cells, that stayed pretty consistently between 20 and 25% reduction. And that's because those practices have enough storage within them that they can reduce that peak flow for all of the storms that we uh, ran, through the, ran through the model. Whenever I talk about any practice, I always get a skeptic, I always get a doubter. And every practice that I talk about, whether it's in urban areas or agricultural areas, every single one has flaws. Um, but I really want to drive home the point that just because a flaw is, a practice has a flaw, that flaw should not be the stopping point. It shouldn't be a reason that you don't do something that should be the starting point for innovation. So, 
you know, maybe a system doesn't work in a particular setting. Well, we got to figure out why and then innovate to move that practice forward. And so in doing that, you know, I think it's important to consider how green infrastructure can work with the existing infrastructure, with gray infrastructure. So this is a uh, street in Raleigh, North Carolina. And along the side of the street, we have a bioretention cell that's collecting runoff in these curb inlets. So it's coming into the bioretention cell and then it, it flows down, flows all the way down. And then this is looking the other direction into the existing storm sewer inlet. And so what we have is a system that, you know, this could have been done when they tore the street up for expanding pipes or doing any kind of type of infrastructure improvement on the street. So it wouldn't have that cost involved. And then they added this bioretention cell, it's probably about uh, three feet wide, and then it ties in with the existing storm sewer inlet. So think of ways we can build green infrastructure into existing inf gray infrastructure, I think is very important. Um, and then just understanding that, you know, not every rain garden or bioretention cell, not every practice is the same. So this is the rain garden that I worked with uh, in Kentucky for my master's. It's actually about 10,000 square feet. It's getting runoff from about uh, one and a half acres of roof and parking lot. And this rain garden, while I was monitoring it, it over overflowed only once um, out of probably 40 storms. And so it was able to capture and hold and infiltrate a, a very significant amount of stormwater. So building green infrastructure in to what would have just gone downstream. This is another one. This is on the campus of the University of Kentucky. Um, again, it's a very different look, but just to drive home the idea that all these practices, um, like they can fit in the setting that they're in. This is one in the backyard Oklahoma City worked with. This is an interesting one where um, the homeowner, he really liked to chip golf balls down into the bottom area here. And so we designed it to um, basically be a chipping green. And so the, the grass, it's not a traditional bioretention cell type mix, um, but it's actually tiff grass that's common in, in uh, golf courses. And then from a for aesthetics perspective, we put in these bald cypress and we had some sand traps in here. So again, thinking about the other functions that landscape can play, water management and water quality can be a role there. This is one in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the one we put in in Sioux Falls. It's our most recent project in Brookings, South Dakota at the Brookings Boys and Girls Club. And then this is the um, rainwater harvesting system at the Brookings Boys and Girls Club. And with any of these practices that we put in, I think monitoring is extremely important because it addresses that question of, you know, does the practice work and does it work for me? And that's able to provide justification for updating standards. It's able to improve watershed models. So as we start to model these systems, you know, how do they perform? We're able to scale these up when we've monitored a system at a, at a small scale, we're able to scale that performance up uh, to, to model those systems across a watershed scale. And then we're also able to appropriately incentivize or credit implementation. So if you put a rain garden in or permeable pavement in that we've monitored and we can demonstrate the performance, now we can appropriately assign a credit to say, you know, that's worth X, Y, and Z um, to our overall water quality goals. Or because you put that rain garden in, you know, that's worth whatever amount to, re because you've reduced the volume, you've reduced the peak flow that otherwise we would have had to account for in our uh, gray stormwater infrastructure. So where do we go from here? Um, I think it's important to look at our toolbox and update it to focus on more than just controlling floods, managing floods. Um, a lot of the water quality issues are at small events and our current infrastructure doesn't do a good job, really doesn't address those small flows at all. Uh, we wanna demonstrate success at the small and large scale and that allows for change, but it doesn't ensure change. So it gives people um, that maybe want to change, it gives them the ability to do so, but it's still just the early adopters that you'll see. And so 
really to get to the middle part of the bell curve, the, the people that aren't early adopters, you have to shift the paradigm with economic impact. Um, also identifying how green infrastructure adds value in other ways. So whether it's pollinators or landscape aesthetics, um, these are all important to help sell the vision for green infrastructure. And all of these barriers that we discussed today, they have to be considered and strategically addressed. But uh, I think there are solutions to overcoming all those barriers. So that's all I've got. Thank you so much um, again for the invitation. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, I am on Twitter. Feel free to follow me for updates on activities and research and outreach and all that good stuff. So with that, um, I'll stop. Great, thank you so much, John. And if anyone has um, questions for John, please feel free to put those in the chat. I am going to... John, and while we're waiting for a question, um, you mentioned you know that shifting, shifting the paradigm, paradigm with economic impact piece. Um, does your team sort of play a role in formulating that type of work? Or, I mean, because you guys are doing such great job with the academic side, the research, and then the practice or implementing these types of indi individual projects. I was just curious if you've delved into that at all. Yeah, so um, I'd say we haven't, we haven't gotten to it from a, implementation perspective. So all the practices that we put in um, or design, we track economics on those, but it doesn't get to those real social science and kind of um, bigger picture economic questions of if we use this in a neighborhood or in a watershed scale, um, you know, does it shift the paradigm? And so that's kind of a next phase that we want to go into is looking at kind of social yes. science aspects and economics. And of course, I'm not a social scientist, um, so we'll work with folks at SDSU who do think about that and, and know kind of how to ask those questions. But that is one of the big questions of how do we shift from, you know, research and demonstration? How do we scale that up and get implementation at a meaningful scale? Right. Well, I look forward to that work. <laughs> um, and then we have a question here from Laura Edwards. For the Brookings area example of curbside water retention, did that replace a bike lane? And are there any concerns about snow removal with the new curbside? So the example, I think Laura is asking about that picture I showed with the curb cut inlets. That was actually from Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, so they don't have to worry about um, any snow removal there, which is unfortunate for them because I would miss snow, I know. Um, but yeah, so there are considerations that we have to, to think about how the systems fit. Um, a lot of times, if you had, say, a bioretention cell that's in a what they call a bulb, um, like a, a, a bump out, so it actually bumps out from the from the curb, those can be traffic calming. They can be built into, you know, maybe existing parking infrastructure. Um, but yes, absolutely. Working with bike lanes and other aspects would be something that you have to consider. And then snow removal and how these perform in the winter. Um, that's another, yeah, again, kind of the logistics of how these go into the ground. Those are things that we have to consider, but they can all work. Um, the Twin Cities have a, a good amount of practices and even quite a few cities in Canada, bigger cities in Canada have some of these. So they can work in cold climates, but um, it is considering logistics of how. All right, it is 2.50. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our um, session three, track three talk for the summit today. Um, thanks for taking the time in your afternoon to join us for the talks. We've had two really great ones so far, and I know we're going to have a really excellent one to finish us off in the, the tracks. Um, I am going to, oh, no, wait, I need to make my housekeeping announcement. So at the end of the talk, I am going to put the link into the chat that will bring us back to the main room for the keynote address. 
Um, so look out for that in the chat. And then that's also available on our website as well in case you duck out. Um, and then if you have any questions, feel free to place those in the chat, type those in the chat, and then I will ask them to our presenters at the end of time. Um, so with that, I will just go ahead and, and uh, introduce our presenters today. So we have two presenters from ISG, Rachel Kloos, she's a forward-thinking, detail-oriented water and wastewater project manager, and ISG Sioux Falls, with more than 20 years of experience in process and environmental engineering. She has specialized expertise in industrial and municipal water and wastewater compliance and optimization of both water use and carbon footprint. Rachel is committed to developing designs to support a sustainable, cost-effective future for communities and businesses throughout South Dakota and the Upper Midwest. And then with her presenting today is Steve Watson, who's a development strategist. Oh, and I'm sorry, Rachel Clouse is the water and wastewater group leader. Um, so Steve Watson, who's the development strategist, um, he is a visionary and strategic thinker who works with business and community leaders across the state to conceptualize and implement projects that improve the economic and social vitality of their communities. As an economic development practitioner with over 16 years of experience, Steve understands the interconnectivity between social, economic, and environmental interests and how to build consensus between different stakeholder groups. Steve is passionate about providing communities in South Dakota with the tools they need to facilitate positive change and determine the best options for their business, including everything from site selection to new developed marketing. So please join me in welcoming Rachel and Steve, and I am going to make them. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everybody. As Holly mentioned, uh, my name is Steve Watson. I'm a development strategist with IS. We're an architecture, engineering, planning, and environmental firm uh, with an office in downtown Sioux Falls. And as was mentioned uh, earlier, I've, I've spent most all of my career promoting Sioux Falls and South Dakota as a place to live, work, and play. And so the, the topic of improving the Big Sioux River really resonates with me, and I know it does with Rachel as well. So I think it's safe to say it's it's because you care about the Big Sioux River, and you, you likely have your own personal reasons for wanting to see it improved. Oops, and I already screwed up and went too far. <laughs> you know, so uh, chances are good to fall into any one of the three categories on the previous slide here. Oops. Yeah, you're going forwards. <laughs> No worries. There you go. More. Perfect. So, so chances are good that your reasons fall into any one of, of three categories, social, environmental, or economic. We call this the triple bottom line framework, which was a concept that was actually pioneered in the 1990s to assign value to sustainable practices. It was used primarily as a business accounting practice, but in the context of today's presentation, we're approaching it from a community development perspective. The case that uh, Rachel and I are looking to make today is really twofold. One, we're looking at improving the Big Sioux's river quality, um, not, not just to improve the habitat, but we're making the case that it also increases its positive economic and social impact on our community. And secondly, our ability to effectively articulate this will help us secure more support and create greater awareness for our efforts. The photos here, I think, do a really great job of uh, helping us visualize the, trip, the triple bottom line in action. So personally, I'm an avid kayaker. Um, you'd, you'd be surprised to know just how many people come from Brookings and Watertown and beyond going out of their way to kayak the Big Sioux and Sioux Falls. It really is a unique experience and an oasis in the middle of the city. Imagine how many more people would recreate on or near the river and contribute to our tax base if we could continue to improve the river's quality. Conversely, how do we educate the person that uses the river for social or well-being on the importance of improving its quality? 
Events like River Fest and improvements to the River Greenway and trail networks all have very tangible benefits to our economy and social well-being. Businesses like ISG want to be close to this action. It creates an emotional connection to a place, something that is difficult to monetize, but its value cannot be overstated. So as advocates for the Big Sioux, we need to discuss the merits of the triple bottom line in our interactions because talking about one category independent of the other two is really only telling part of the story. Um, now, for those of you that would like to further understand the, the triple bottom line methodology and, and geek out on case studies, I invite you to visit landscapeperformance.org. Landscapeperformance.org. It's a great resource. For the rest of you, though, um, that would rather not have the next five slides talk about numbers and statistics, don't worry. I've spared that. <laughs> So, you know, defining why we should improve the Big Sioux River really is the easy part, I think. The difficult part is actually getting something meaningful accomplished. And to do that, I think we have to recognize that small changes lead to bigger change. And while changes in agriculture practices and wastewater management techniques and the regulatory framework, which oversees both, can result in significant change, those efforts take a lot of time and change comes painfully slow. It doesn't mean that we should give up on these efforts, nor should it be an excuse for inaction. The current state of our river is the result of a confluence of many different factors, but within our circle of influence. The trash that we see in the river and along its banks has much, as much to do with runoff as anything else. The same is true for the sediment that is building up and some toxins that are present. You cannot pinpoint one source. You cannot blame one industry. Our challenge, in other words, is complex, which means the solutions need to be varied. The good news is we all can do something as part of a solution today, which can have a more immediate impact tomorrow. So next, Rachel is going to share some tangible solutions we believe are within our reach. Thank you, Steve. So sustainability, what does it mean to you? It means something different to everyone that will think about it. It can mean a lot of things, but it's important to understand that the triple bottom line as it relates to sustainability. Can it stand the test of time? Does it improve the quality of life for myself or others? Does it impact the economy and in which way? When I walk the river greenways or kayak with my kids in the natural environment, I am so proud of our city and I want to contribute to its continued improvement and accessibility for others. That's what sustainability is for me. So when I start thinking and try to get inspired about what I can contribute and what we can contribute as a community, I want to take a minute to look beyond Sioux Falls for innovation and inspiration. We are in an innovative and forward-thinking community, and we're known for being the first, the first in the Midwest, or everything like that. And it serves us well to look beyond our borders and look for possibilities. For example, here I have highlighted the City Hall in Chicago, Illinois, Illinois, built in 1911 as a grand structure to set precedence and expectations of greatness. It was retrofitted in 2001 to include a green roof. Again, setting leading examples to focus on urban heat development initiatives. The second example is a whitewater park in Fort Collins. Located in the foothills of the Rockies, whitewater rafting is reserved for more mountain destinations. This innovative idea stemmed from developing a flood diversion channel to reduce the flooding risk. The diversion channel now provides an innovative recreation and economic benefit to the community while still providing flood control. The Rockstar Energy Park in Houston, Texas. It was constructed under a Houston Development and Beautification Program. This 22-acre world-class BMX park became an oasis for the Houston community. Designed in a floodplain, this 100% permeable paved parking lot also incorporates wood, uh, a woodland bike trail, uh, street courses, and over 700 trees. And finally, the Great Bubble Barrier in Amsterdam. The capital of the Netherlands recognized the increasing amount of plastic and debris flowing through rivers and canals, leading to a series of major canals heading to the North Sea. 
This innovative design uses micro bubbles to lift and direct plastic into a collection chamber. The system does not interfere with ship passage or aquatic life. In fact, the dissolved oxygen levels have been soothed, stimulating the ecosystem. We heard a little bit about this from Jay earlier. This innovative this innovation is not part of a global solution in trash, in trash removal. It has increased the immediate water quality for the economic and social benefit. In, a, in addition, I bet the bubble barrier itself is attracting visitors and innovators in the city. There we go. There we go. There are so many great examples of sustainable design solutions in Sioux Falls, and we should celebrate the success of projects like Deliver Greenway and other public-private partnerships that show what an amazing community we are. City of Sioux Falls is driving us down an amazing path. Groups like Friends of the Big Sioux are also great partners. I personally want to see more visibility of these projects so I can personally thank those, those involved or go out of my way to do business with those folks. Here are a couple of examples of ISG has highlighted in the last few years. The Des Moines uh, Market District Revitalization Project is a project that's, under, that's in process right now where we're adding curb checkouts to encourage better pedestrian traffic and more green space in their downtown area. Bioretention cells and biofuels in Harrisburg recently functioned to improve flood management while improving water quality and improving streetscape. That's a great picture. And then finally, the Sioux City Promenade took a large concrete area that was not well utilized and added pathways and tree trenches, bioretention, and permeable pavers to create a green gathering and event area with a purpose for improving water quality. Each one of these examples followed that triple bottom line example in which we not only solved an environmental issue and improved them, but we also impacted the social and economic benefits. So what does this mean for Sioux Falls? There has been and continues to be an amazing effort toward improving the river quality in our community. It most certainly is the heart of our great city and provides an economic, social, and environmental reason to live and work here, but also to relocate here. We may someday design, we may someday design and construct a whitewater path, a whitewater park in the South Dakota or the South Dakota version of the Great Barrier Bubble Barrier. But in reality, most great accomplishments accomplishments are small but exponential. One of my most favorite stories relates to the airline industry. In the 1970s, likely similar to what they are experiencing now, the economic path is serious. Airline executives masterminded multiple plans to curtail the economic bleed to include layoffs and reducing services. All those ideas would have, could have, and likely worked. A stewardess in the airline made a suggestion. Remove the olives from the in-flight meals. The idea was impactful. Who else would have ever noticed all of the meal? Nonetheless, even recognized the potential economic impact. Removing those olives from the meal for every flight, times the amount of flights per day, was impactful. It started a trend in which other employees recognized the opportunity to identify and remove their own olives. This exponential impact of the olives and resulting future olives not only provided needed economic relief, but created an emotional commitment to its success. Do we have any olives in Sioux Falls that we can identify? So a couple examples of olives I brought. So my example, this is one of my favorite places to ride or, or walk, ride, bike or walk. We have taken numerous pictures in this woody area north of the farmer's market at Falls Park. I've seen a couple turkeys there too. I also noticed major stormwater drainage and collection flowing to the river that carries a lot of significant amount of debris and garbage. Since the area is so woody, there's not a lot of ground vegetation to slow the water down and filter out debris and water impurities. I've also noticed erosion, sediment, and heading to the river. What if we removed some of those trees to allow more sunlight to allow ground cover to thrive? We could restore some of the channels feeding the river to decrease erosion while still managing the water flow. Again, just all of them. All right. Another favorite area is the farmer's market. Saturday mornings are a great experience and in some cases pretty busy. 
you're like me, I always end up in the overflow parking and can, it can get muddy and messy sometimes, but it's also creating an opportunity for sediment and other impurities to run into the river. We created an innovative parking structure that allows both for structure, but also utilizes green infrastructure for filtration and protection of runoff. This area could be an educational showcase for our city. In South Dakota, it rains. Those crazy downpours that dump water for 10 to 15 minutes seems to become becoming more common. I work downtown and the street flooding and traffic upset during these events is mind blowing. I've noticed the incredibly the incredible sheeting coming off flat top roofs is a major contributor to temporarily overwhelming the storm sewer system. What if we could identify one or two of these buildings to put a rain collection system onto? But think we collect the immediate rain and slowly release it to the storm sewer as a slower rate. The visual would be amazing and certainly something we could talk about over town. And maybe in the use that water for irrigation or even toilet flushing. Dude. Absolutely. <laughs> Trash in any kind makes our city look like we don't care. And that is just simply not true. I don't know, for those who know me, I'm obsessed with taking pictures of math that I find in the beginner. <laughs> it's a problem I need to fix. <laughs> From participating in numerous river and city cleanups over the years, one thing you can always count on is a repeat appearance or more trash to pick up. It's a great club to join because there's an endless amount of stuff to do. I took this picture of a mask in the gutter downtown while waiting for my sushi. I don't want to analyze the individual mask, but is the garbage a trend? Is this particular era getting much worse for garbage because the wind howls through the area and planting some trees may reduce the amount? Is there a business or residential area that can relocate the dumpsters? The garbage is staying put. When you're in San Francisco, there is garbage everywhere. And I'm certainly not comparing us to, the, to that city. But I also noticed that when you're in San Francisco, the garbage receptacles are very far apart. So I tend to hold my trash longer, which is likely that you're going to end up dumping it or somebody will end up dumping it. Could adding more bins or any type of bins help in our situation? Maybe we could target specific target areas for stormwater trash collection and inlet or inlet and outlet trash collection. Again, it's all about identifying the off. So now that we have the juices flowing and we've got some ideas that we've pulled together, how do we move forward? Continue our great momentum and get more people involved. Maybe you've wondered as a business or a resident, how can I contribute? How can you provide an olive and then take care of it? I'm sure you have ideas, resources, and most importantly, the desire to improve our city. We have identified the what, river water quality, and we have identified the why, triple bottom line, the social, economic, and environmental benefits. So now, how about the how? So an idea that we've got is this, how many olives can we identify and how many can we improve? Wouldn't it be great if next year at this very same summit that we were reviewing our list and we can high five our accomplishments, hopefully in person. We at IFG use, use social pinpoint for a lot of our projects. It allows us to get community involvement and measure impact. The link below is active. Feel free to pinpoint an area of the river or city you think needs some improvement or maybe even an idea. Browse other ideas and comments. I agree, I like that. Let's create a list of potential opportunities to review and talk about. Maybe you or your business would like to adopt a section of the river to improve or clean up. Maybe you were looking for an opportunity to improve the river and participate. I, like many, like to be part of the solution. I choose to put together the pinpoint, but it can be managed by another group or an organization. The key is to work together for the common goal of the river. Do you have an olive to share? So I'm really of the potential of this, and I think collectively we could probably identify a lot of opportunities up and down the river, not only in Sioux Falls, but north and south and east and west. So um, we really encourage you to take some time. This uh, the social pen point is going to be open for uh, in perpetuity at this point, but the intent is is to populate this with enough opportunities that we can then develop a strategy working with some of our partners, including the city, um, to, to start, you know, kind of 
checking, checking off the list. So we hope that you'll take the time to populate it. So with that, um, Holly, I'm not sure how we necessarily do the, the Q&A, but it looks like we do have about five minutes. Uh, I think you're going to be managing that for us. Yep. Yes. So I just sent out um, to everybody in the chat. If you have questions, please type those in the chat and I will read them to you too. Um, so we have a question, um, a comment and question that says major changes need to be made by land developers. How are you going to get developers to start embracing green changes or how would you? I think that there's a there's a number of developers in the community that have um, embraced the concept of low impact design. I think that there's um, some value in creating more awareness around the benefits of that, much like we talked about the economic and social benefits. I think that the, the more that we can educate people on um, the, the return on those investments, um, more are going to be willing to follow suit. And I know that just conversations I've had with the city of Sioux Falls, you know, they're very receptive to sitting down with those developers and maybe identifying areas where they could uh, incorporate different sustainable practices. It's also about setting those expectations, right? We talked about the example of the green roof in Chicago or things like that. We've got to make that major step. So we set the precedent. Sioux Falls is open to those types of uh, activities and development and change is, is well worthwhile. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions from anybody for Rachel and Steve? And I know you had that that link up, and I was wondering if I should try to type that in the chat. Can you back up one page? Just so everybody could have that. I think it was a bitly. Yep. Yep. Okay. I think I got that bitly. Um, so we have another question that came in. Um, how would ISG propose to fund these types of efforts? So we talked about that. Um, you know, some of these some of these things are, I think, rather um, low cost um, solutions that we had identified earlier. And I think that there's organizations that are looking to make investments in tangible solutions. And so, for example. Um, would be very receptive to um, investing in something that aligns with our corporate philosophy, which is sustainability. Um, and there's there's a number of organizations that I think uh, are that probably share similar values that would be willing to to step up and 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 help. And and I also think that and what I like about the idea of creating a social pinpoint is. You know, we're, we're going to these uh, philanthropists, to these business leaders, to 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 government and others, and presenting them with, I mean, potentially 200 different projects to to pick from. And there might be some that resonate a little bit more with others. Maybe the geography is one that they're they're really, um, you know, they're really interested in doing something along the River Greenway. Um, or a certain park, or maybe they're passionate about a certain type of technology. Um, I think giving people options um, is, is probably the best thing we can do. And also incorporating value, right? So we want to be able to exclusively talk about what the value of these items are as it relates to that triple bottom line. Great, thank you. And then we have um, another question here. Are you proposing activities above or below Sioux Falls, both rural areas and major towns like Watertown and Brookings? So, I mean, we, we started with Sioux Falls, but there's no reason that this could not be expanded to include the entire. Um, 
just for clarification, the social pin is down to town is where they have it set up right there, but it's easy enough to pull that. And then the cool thing about this is you're not only going to identify things, but you're going to see what other people are identifying. And you might, the greatest thing about a social pin point is you're going to see something where you're like, I didn't, I forgot about that. That's what I want to like that. So maybe we will have 20 people that are really interested in this particular project. So we can see those things. And then we've got another question. Thank you guys. Lots of questions coming in. This is great. Are there current active efforts that might be similar or headed in the same direction? And I'm not sure if that's um, talking about this social pinpoint or just the, the broad scope of practices you're talking about um, in your presentation. I guess I'm not aware if there's another, um, you know, social pinpoint that's, that's being used. Um, but, but if there is, I mean, there's an opportunity to collaborate. Absolutely. I think one of the big opportunities that we see as um, members of the community and, and really concerned and want to be part of the river quality is that there's not a lot of visibility to the projects that are going on and the improvement. We not only want to knock some stuff off the list, but we want to celebrate their success and their completion. And we want to make sure that that's visible across the group. And, and we thought that the Big Sea River Summit is a great place to start that camaraderie. I mean, one of the impetuses too for us to be thinking about this is, you know, just looking at our own firm, and and we have a we have an event that we call Impact Day, where ISGers go out in the community and look to make an impact. And you know, I, I really like the idea of having a, a kind of a targeted approach where maybe we focus on one particular area and we just, you know, <laughs> blast it with all we've got. Um, I think there's other organizations that are are looking for that direction, um, that creativity, and and I think this can provide it for them. Muted. I knew I wouldn't go one the whole time without talking while muted. So, uh, and one last question here. Um, do you guys, are you finding that you have customers that are willing to adopt green practices, whether that be, you know, private businesses, broader industries and things like that? I think the answer is 110% absolutely. Um, and in fact, I think we even try to seek out those clients because our, um, we align, our value systems align, mm -hmm. but yes. Um, and then do you know, um, you know, thinking about these practices, how, this is another question that came in, how might this be improving the Big Sioux River quality as it relates to fish, water quality, TSS, E. coli? Sure. So every activity that we've talked about is ultimately there to improve the river quality. So the first we talked, we talked about that exponential impact. If we start moving to erosion control on the riverbanks, that's ultimately going to help with suspended solids and sediment control, those types of things in the river. You're right. There's so many things that we can do to improve the river water quality. But there's little isolated items as far as runoff from parking lots and other contaminants that are coming into the system. All of these projects that we talk about is using nature to help filter and improve the water quality in, into the into the big sea. And really, if by adjusting and managing our stormwater, we could be focusing on replenishing aquifers uh, and reducing the amount of runoff going into the river as well, which ultimately is good for the entire community.